Okay, welcome back everyone. So in this next lecture, we're going to get into something that is called the atmospheric cycle. And let's just get right into it. So it might seem odd to talk about the atmosphere and use the word cycle because doesn't it just appear to be just maybe one big mass of air? The air in one place is the same as the air in another place, right? That's what I would think. But at any one point, the atmosphere can be divided into many separate what are called air masses. And in order to understand the properties of air masses, we first need to define two closely related terms, weather and climate. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at a given time and place. It could be highly variable from day to day and especially season to season. We're pretty familiar with that. Climate is a place's long-term average of that area's weather condition. An area could be hot, it could be cold, it can be wet, it can be dry, but the weather could be different from day to day. So if you live up north and it's a little cold, you know, mostly cold and, and wet, that doesn't mean that it's cold and wet all the time. You could have pretty hot days. But on average, you know, it's more, it's more um, cold and a little bit more wet than, it, say, if you live down south in Texas, okay? Um, and those are just micro-scale differences in climate. If we think about um, the Sahara Desert versus uh, the tropical rainforests, um, those uh, places are are different in spatial, you know, spatial distance, and their climate, um, their climates are much much different from each other. Okay, um, and so and there's not to say that you know there might not be uh, slightly hotter or slightly colder days in those areas, um, but when we talk about climate, it's the long term average. So let's talk about weather. There are five variables that are going to be used to define the state of the atmosphere at any given place. The temperature, the air pressure, the humidity, the cloudiness, the prevailing winds. The local weather report is typically, typically going to cover all of these, okay? Now let's talk about a little bit more in depth on each of those five. So we start with temperature. The temperature reported in daily weather predictions always refers to the temperature at ground level. Why is that? And the reason for that is temperature varies strongly with altitude above the ground. The major layers of the atmosphere, for example, the stratosphere and the troposphere, are actually defined by their temperature variations. So, of course, maybe you're not familiar with this, but I'm sure you probably are. The higher you go up into the atmosphere, the colder it gets. Um, now let's talk about pressure. Pressure is going to decrease significantly with altitude, just like temperature, because air is compressed by its own weight. Pressure also varies laterally, so side to side, because air masses tend to move and rotate with respect to each other. Air piles up in some places to form a high pressure system, and it stretches out in other places to form a low pressure system. Air in low pressure systems tends to rise, and that causes cooling and increased clouds, and conversely, high pressure systems tend to feature warmer and drier air. Significant air pressure differences, which can arise at the boundaries between layers high in the atmosphere, cause high speed air currents called the jet stream. The jet stream moves west to east across the United States, and it's actually very noticeable if you take a flight. If you take a flight from New York, to LA and then take that same flight from LA to New York, going back to New York will take an hour off of that flight time. And that's because you've got that strong headwind pushing you, um, <laughs> slowing you down if you're going to LA and a tailwind pushing you faster if you are going to New York. And so that's what differences in pressure can, can lead to. So humidity, humidity is the measure of the atmosphere's highly variable water content. The bulk composition of the atmosphere, the dry atmosphere, is remarkably uniform. 99% of it, nitrogen and oxygen. The atmosphere, though, also contains some water vapor, but it's highly variable, and it's just dependent on the temperature and the relative humidity. On a cool, dry winter day, you could have less than 0.1% water by volume, whereas on a hot, humid summer day, you could have up to several percent of humidity. And so, of course, uh, I think we're all pretty familiar of what humidity does 
uh, and how it makes you feel. And it's not my favorite thing, uh, but that's what humidity is. It's the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now, cloudiness. Cloudiness is closely tied to humidity. Clouds are a concentration of tiny water droplets or ice crystals, and those substances scatter light, so that's why clouds appear to be white. And maybe that's a fact you haven't known before. Clouds form when air becomes saturated with water, and then the air rises and cools. Now, one uh, thing that's kind of interesting that you might see um, if you go to a mountainous region is that on the wind, the wind side, or the side where the wind is blowing into the mountain, you'll get a lot of rain, a lot of cloud cover. That's because this air get, hits the, the mountain and rises and cools. And when it rises and cools, it condenses into the cloud and then also rains down through precipitation. On the other side, that there's no more <laughs> water vapor to be released. And so there's just, they call it the rain shadow region. One uh, place where this happens is in... Hawaii, where on the wind side of the mountain, they could get up to 400 inches of rain a year. And on the other side, it's pretty arid, almost desert-like. And that's just because that's how you know, this, this works, where the, where the air vapor uh, rises and cools and starts to uh, produce rain. And so it's pretty interesting how mountains can affect climate where you're just, you know, separated by just this amount of space, which, you know, is just the mountain and your climate is completely different. Okay, winds. Winds are a consequence of atmospheric convection. Where have we heard the word convection? Well, when we were talking about how rocks would cool, would rot, heat, and rise up, and then cool and sink down, well, it's still the same thing. Atmospheric convention, uh, convection is just m moving around air, basically. It's a process that redistributes heat. Ocean breezes on a summer day will help me illustrate how winds can occur. So you're on the beach during a sunny day. The land is going to heat up more than the water, okay? So the warmer air rises from the land and the cooler air flows in from where the water is. And that gives you that refreshing breeze coming off of the sea. Now at night, water holds on to the heat better than the, the air, the, sorry, better than the land does. And so in the evening, the process is reversed Whereas the water, uh, the, the heat uh, from the uh, water rises and the breeze flows out to the sea. And so that's just one way that you can think about how these winds happen. Now, let's talk about the general circulation of the atmosphere. The prevailing winds, which are basically the, the large movements of air in the atmosphere, these winds arise much in the same way as the local winds, but just on a much, much larger scale. The circulation is going to be also powered by the energy of the sun. Air in the tropics is heated and rises, and first of all, if the earth did not rotate, what we would expect is the air to rise at the equator, cool off, and then sink at the poles. If the earth did not rotate, we would expect the prevailing winds to flow north to south, correct? Now, they move from west to east in reality because the earth rotates. So this is what we would expect if the earth did not rotate, where at the equator it would heat up because that's the direct contact with the sun, heat up, and then um, as, it, as over time it would flow towards the, the poles, cool and then crash back down and then that would that's what we would expect if the earth did not rotate of course we know that the earth does in fact rotate and so this is what we get where we have prevailing winds we currently live um, if you're in the united states anyway you live in what are called the prevailing westerlies where uh the the wind is blowing from the west to the east um now if you live in a different area of course they can go the other way Basically, what, what this is called is the Coriolis effect, and it's the effect that the overall wind, prevailing winds are, um, have based on the Earth spinning and rotating. And so I won't get too much into this, but just take a look at how, um, where you might live and where the Earth, uh, where the Earth spinning makes the winds move. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, let's talk about some storms and weather patterns. Um, let's talk about the severe weather and something that we should all be pretty familiar with right now considering what's going on. Um, the tropical storms that are occurring at a record pace right now, um, they are severe storms and they start as low pressure areas over warm ocean water. Now, 
they continue to get power when they're over water because the air just continues to rise into them and it makes them spin faster and faster. Now, when those uh, storms occur in the Atlantic Ocean, they're called hurricanes. And when they used to, when they, they used to be called typhoons when they begin in the North Pacific Ocean. But um, we've kind of moved on to calling all of them uh, hurricanes. But if you ever see the word typhoon, just know it's a hurricane that's happening in the North Pacific. The other, uh, and actually, if you uh, believe it, the more um, aggressive uh, weather, <laughs> weather event is a tornado, which are rotating air funnels that descend from the storm clouds to the ground. Now, they are extremely, uh, obviously, both types, hurricanes uh, and tornadoes, are both extremely damaging, but tornadoes uh, are very, very aggressive <laughs> and um, can happen very quickly and suddenly, whereas hurricanes and typhoons, we get, uh, we can get, you know, using Doppler radar, we can get some uh, days notice and try to get people to evacuate. Um, when we see tropical storms that are most likely going to turn into hurricanes as they speed up. Um, the, the next thing I want to talk about is something called El Nino. Now, El Nino, uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's named uh, El Nino, which kind of means Christ child. And the reason that it's named that is because um, it usually begins around Christmas time. Now, El Nino can cause severe storms and flooding all along the western coast of the Americas, and it also causes drought from Australia to India. Now, El Nino requires both winds and ocean currents to develop, and it's this example of a coupling between two of Earth's cycles. And in this case, the two cycles are the atmospheric and the water cycles. So here's what happens. Normally, the winds off of the coast of Peru blow westward, okay? They, we've seen that, the westerly. They move the warm ocean water westward as well, like water sloshing in a bathtub, like towards the western Pacific. Now, as the surface water moves west, the colder, nutrient-rich nutrient -rich water from the deep ocean wells up, because you're moving the warm surface water away, and so the, the cold water moves up, and it supports the marine life, and it gives the fish um, eating birds something to eat. And, but because the eastern Pacific is cooler, the atmosphere cools and descends there, forming this zone of high pressure and dry weather off the coast of South America. Meanwhile, the, all that is going on, the western Pacific is warmer, so air warms and rises above that region in a rainy, low-pressure zone. But, so that's what normally happens, but every four to seven years, this pattern changes, and this signifies the beginning of an El Nino event. You get warm surface water sloshing to the east, the water temperature in the eastern Pacific increases by a few degrees, and the normal atmospheric patterns switch places. Westerly winds replace the normally eastern flowing, what they call the trade winds. This wind reversal, basically what happens, it reinforces the movement of warm water eastward to the coast of South America, where air warms and rises and creates raining conditions. The marine life in birds no longer get supported by the nutrients of the cold deep water. Okay, the western Pacific becomes relatively cool and dry, and eventually the water sloshes back and the whole cycle will repeat itself. Now, if you look back at historical records, it tells that those, that cycle begins repeating in the Pacific Basin at least since the 1600s. Now, that's pretty much, you know, as far as data goes back, it's probably been happening for much, much longer. Um, but it's, and we, we assume at least since the last ice age that this has been going on. So El Nino is just an in interesting thing where the weather cycle is completely changed every four to seven years due to changes in atmospheric and the water cycle. So you can see how a normal climate can be impacted by different cycles that the earth normally goes through. And so um, that sort of brings me to this point. We've heard the term climate change, and you know, you might think back as long as you've been on this earth, has the climate changed? Well, recorded history, you're right, climate has been relatively stable, but recorded history only goes back 4,000 years. Correct, 4,000 years is a long time when you think about it as a human being. 
but 4,000 years is a blink of an eye in geologic time. I did some math for you. 4,000 years is 0.00008888, repeating, of Earth's history, okay? That's 4,000 years is that little. And so, so really, 4,000 years is just this blink of an eye when we talk about the history of Earth. And so... Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that climate definitely changes. It changes at a, a slow pace for our mindset, but it relatively, uh, can change relatively quickly uh, when you think about the Earth in general. Now, what I won't get into in this, uh, this lecture, what we will eventually get into in the next few chapters, is that we need to start understanding how humans, how we as a species, may impart change onto the Earth. That will help us predict the changes in climate that we are causing to become faster. Now, one of the things that's very important to understand is that, yes, the, the world has gone through warming and cooling periods before, but they, it's never occurred at the rate at, that we can, we've seen from drilling down into the, the earth and taking out cores of the earth and looking and seeing how things are changing and seeing how atmospheric carbon has changed, all of these things we are help we are you know leading to uh this man made climate change and so the word climate change um it obviously is a very big buzzword politically but if you think about it scientifically there is no doubt that humans are having a huge impact in this area so we'll we'll get into that eventually um but i want to i want to stop here let me know if you've got any questions on this lecture i know we went through quite a bit but i will see you in the next one